Welcome to FCF Tucson, and thank you for visiting our broadcasts. Before we get into this message, we want to let you know that if you have any need for prayer or victories you'd like to share, you can let us know through the links in the video description below. And if you've been blessed by these teachings and would like to help us to reach others, you can securely give by visiting our website or clicking on the link again in the video description below. And lastly, please consider helping us to get this message out by sharing it or sharing our page with your friends and family. It is such an honor for us when you do. Thank you. And now, today's message. Who is like you, Lord, in all the earth? Matchless love and beauty and endless love. Nothing in this world will satisfy. Jesus, you're the cup that will run. I'll sing that line again. Jesus, Jesus, you're the cup that will run dry. Your presence is heaven. Oh, your presence is heaven. of my heart treasure of my heart and of my soul in my weakness you are merciful redeemer of my past and present wrong holder of my days to come, all your presence is Oh, 
you got to really help me. This lets you know this song is from, what, 1984, 85, something like that. But if you, you wouldn't have known if I hadn't told you. It's a Petra song. Sound like a Petra song, but it's a Petra song. But it requires great skill and determination because we're going to sing a round. You know what a round is? I mean, some of you are going to sing one thing while the rest of you sing something else. So we're going to start out in unison. That means all together. <laughs> Amen. But at some point in time, Ash and I are going to go south. And the rest of you are going to continue doing what you're doing. All right? Now, when Josh and I go south, if you're a fella, you should follow us. If you're a female, you will stay with Ann, okay? She's just going to keep on singing right down the but we're going to jump off and go the other way at some point. So, the best advice anyone ever gave a woman, I'm about to give you. So don't follow me. <laughs> Let our voices rise like incense.
scriptures this morning. I want to again talk about moms for just a minute. I already gave you the disclaimer. Amen. Now, first, before we do anything else, I can think of three people I'm pretty sure of. If there's anybody else, I want you to... to Oh, you're pointing at Wilma. I thought you were pointing over here somewhere. Okay. Give it. While John was saying about the leg, I have a sense from the Lord that this is a gift from God. Healing is a gift to the children. And, um, but I have a sense that, uh, that some of the people, and even some of the other people that are going to listen to the word today, uh, are holding because they feel like they don't deserve uh, what is given. And um, and as I was uh, and as I was, I was receiving this, what I received was that when God, uh, when they brought that woman that have sinned before the presence of Jesus, and have all these people that were accusing her, um, the word that Jesus gave this woman at the end was, you know what, they don't accuse. Where are the, the ones that accuse you? And um, she said that nobody was there. But then Jesus said, go and sin no more. I, I don't accuse you either. I don't have anything against you. You are a child. If you are a child, you, you are able to receive. There are people here that, that have this sadness, and, I, and this is what I sense, uh, a, a sense of sadness and desperation and, and, and of of. of I don't know what I'm doing here today. I should be one of those that have stayed home. But um, you are here because God has something really great for you today. He has a word of encouragement. He wants you to go out of here with no guilt. Because, I mean, <laughs> there are things that you will regret. There are things that you will, will, um, will always say, I could have done better. But you know what? All of us have that in our hearts. All of us could have done better. And if we, sh we could go back, we probably will do better. But God has something for you from now on. He's looking from now on. And he wants you to receive like if, if today is your day to receive from now on. Amen. 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 Look, look at somebody around you and just say, God's not holding it against you. God's not holding it against you. Amen. Amen. Everybody's got their own it. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I couldn't figure out what John was doing back there. But he was pointing over there somewhere. Amen. Henry, I know you're in this classification. Janet, I know you are. Uh, Leo here, there's Leo. Uh, for, for all the folks here who this is your first Mother's Day since your mother went to be with, with the Lord, um, I just want to give a special word to you. I've been there. Uh, if that's you, if, if, uh, if this is your first Mother's Day without your mother, uh, can you stand up where you are for just a minute? Okay, praise God. Amen. I just had in my heart this morning, uh, for some reason or another, I mean, it's been seven years since my mother bailed out on me. 
But uh, I mean, she was 89. She had a right to it if she wanted to. But <laughs> she got tired of working in kids' clubs. So. <laughs> she said, the only way he's going to let me rest is if I go to heaven. <laughs> but, yeah. I just want to say to you today that, that sometimes it's difficult because we have these memorial moments. And uh, as, as Wilma was sharing, a lot of times there's things you go back and do different if you had it to do again. Uh, but you know what? Today, she don't care. I mean, she has passed uh, being happy to not be trapped in that old body anymore, to not be messing with the ups and downs of this uh, mortal veil. She is one happy camper today. And if you're around one of these folks, just reach your hand over and lay your hand on them. Let the mother of all mothers, there's, there's Dorothy, lay your hand on Leo. Amen. The, uh, uh, let's just pray for a moment for that comfort and peace in these precious hearts today. Father God, we thank you and praise you for these. We thank you, Father God, uh, for uh, mothers that imparted to their lives, and we thank you that, that mothers who have gone on before, and we thank you today for the Holy Spirit of God that lives in them, that lives in them, who is the comforter, the comforter, who brings peace, comfort, joy in the face of whatever adversity. But today we want confidence concerning the well-being of their loved ones. We thank you for that. We thank you for the peace of God that passes all understanding, that keeps their heart and mind in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. For some reason, my grandma's been on my mind all week. I don't know why. I mean, she was my mother's mother. Sometimes I think she had a bigger impact than my mother did. But uh, I was thinking about honoring. And, uh, you know, even in, with anybody, you can think of something that you learn. Judy, Judy has a, a fabulous way of saying this. She said, some people are just a good example of a bad example. Yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, so if that's the best you can do, then God bless you. But, but, you know, at the very least, we know how not to do it, don't we? Amen. My, thinking about my grandmother, my granddad was that way. He was a good example of a bad example. I posted a picture of him online just because I looked like him, but. The, uh, <laughs> but after, after uh, my dad passed away and the, the old bit was in the paper, we're at the, all gathering at the house after the funeral, you know, all these people are standing around. We get a phone call uh, from my mom, you know, and it's some guy on the phone. And he said, you don't know me, but I'm your brother. Turns out Grandpa had a whole other family. We knew about two. We didn't know about number three. <laughs> As they used to say, Granddaddy was a rounder. <laughs> he was always around doing something. <laughs> anyway, so my grandmother gave me a lesson in how to survive in spite. Amen. Amen. She was. She had the. the she, she defined the word overcomer. <laughs> Hit me again. I'm just going to run you over. Amen. So you can always find something to honor and speak well of. But this day, we want to honor the mothers in this house. Amen. Oh, if you are a mother, if you have given birth to children, you are qualified. Or if you've adopted children, taken care of them. Amen. Oh, some, some people became mothers accidentally. Other people did it on purpose and took care of other people's kids. God bless you. Amen. Seriously. Thank God. But if that's you, if you're a mom, would you just stand up? Let us bless you. Amen. Let us just speak blessing over you. Amen. We have a gift for you, so keep standing. Amen. And while they're gifting, I'm going to say, I believe that your seed are blessed of the Lord. I believe that those young ones who God has given you their lives to oversee, given you their lives to nurture, given you their lives to teach, that you will, in fact, have the opportunity and the anointing to impart truth into their lives. 
that they will grow and develop in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and fulfill the plan and the course that God has for them. I believe that you will be blessed in your doing and blessed in your going and that you will indeed be able to lay down at night and sleep in peace. Amen. Even though, even though your children may not be doing what you think they ought to do right now because you have given them to one who can do something and that is the Lord our God. Amen. So I call you blessed. I call you peaceful. And I call you joyous in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Did, every, did everybody get a sack? All right. Amen. We are glad you are here. God bless you. Yeah, I was kind of envious. I thought they were kind of neat. But if you have a Bible with you, it seemed like to me on Mother's Day that I, I actually skipped what I was the, my schedule because I got behind last week. I had this planned ahead of time, but then I threw myself off last week. So we'll, we'll just rearrange and move it around. We'll get back to it next week. But the, uh, we're, we're talking about uh, maturity, spiritual maturity, and the, the evidence or the symptoms thereof. What's our, what are we shooting at here? Well, we're shooting to look like Jesus, but, but uh, in, in measurables, what does that look like? What are our metrics for determining how we're doing? And man, one of the biggies just comes to my mind on Mother's Day. And that is, everybody say love. 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 Amen. Uh, let's look in 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll read our text for the maturity series. Verse 1. He said, so get rid of all evil behavior. Look at somebody and say, be a doer of that word. All right. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Oh my. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. Oh, glory. In our, in our walk into spiritual maturity, we saw last time that uh, we at least defined immaturity, strife and division and and being a hearers and not doers. And uh, we looked at the importance of developing perseverance and consistency in our walk. Mature Christians are what? Consistent. Amen. Amen. Uh, we've been praying for revelation and not just information. Amen. We're not just going to define love. We're going to understand love today. Amen. And so let's look in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew, the fifth chapter. I had this all ready to go, and then I had to change something before the service. Back and go. Okay, here's a passage right here at the end of the fifth chapter of Matthew that for many years, I just wore this sucker out. You all have passages in your Bible where they start to, the, the print starts to fade on the page because you've used it so many times. That's James chapter 1 where it says, ask for wisdom, that's mine. And then this one here, especially when I first came to the Lord, because I had me a list of people that I thought somebody needed to slap. And I would be happy to be appointed for that duty. But in verse 43, it says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? As you can tell, tax collectors to Jesus were the measure of sorry people. Amen. One of the guys that was one of my best friends in college became an IRS agent. 
Never spoke to him again. I don't <laughs> no, that's not true. He, he actually called me and helped us out when we were incorporating, believe it or not. Gave us a little behind-the-scenes info we needed. Amen. He said, what do you do more than others? What's he asking? He said, even the heathen know how to be nice to people that are nice to them. What makes you different? He said, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. We took that text last week. Perfect means mature. Christian maturity does what? Loves people. Loves people. I mean, the Bible says clearly God is what? Love. Right. God is love. So if we're going to walk like Christ, what are we going to do? We're going to love people. Amen? Amen. Now, clearly in this passage, he's talking about uh, a kind of love that God bestows on people not based on whether they deserve it or not. What does he say? He sends rain on the just and on the unjust. That means uh, you don't have to be a, a Christian in order for your crops to get rained on. Amen. Sometimes we get all mad about people getting blessed because we don't think they deserve it. If everybody got what they deserved, the world would be completely uninhabited. Amen. <laughs> you don't want what you deserve, and you don't. I, I don't want to be the one who judges others in terms of get them getting what they deserve, because if they start getting what they deserve, I might start getting what I deserve, and then I would be in trouble. This is a love that's way beyond the world's ability to even conceive of. Jesus was having trouble teaching about it here at this point. He was talking to Old Testament people. You understand when Jesus was on the earth, when he, went, when he was still speaking in red letters. <laughs> in the Old Testament, you notice he spoke in black letters. But after the incarnation, he spoke in red letters. I don't know why mystery hidden from the foundations of the world <laughs> if you don't get that ask somebody they'll explain it to you later but the, he was still speaking in red letters so he's talking what talking to jews the sermon on the mount was not sent to you particularly it was sent to believing jews who were under the law that's why he used all these illustrations about the scribes and the pharisees and the tax collector right but they knew exactly what he was talking about so he's trying to explain to them the kind of love that god has for people and in doing that, he said, he rains on the just and on the unjust. The sun shines on the just and on the unjust. If you're nice to those who are nice to you, you're just like a tax collector. Why aren't you any better than that? Amen. So he's, talking to, he's trying to tell them, the world doesn't get this kind of love. Love and bless your enemies. People don't grasp that. Uh, most of us look at the do unto others as you would have them do unto you phrase, you know. And we don't read it that way. We say, do unto others before they do it unto you. This kind of love reflects the nature of the Father, and He blesses everybody equally. Love that is reserved for those that deserve it is earthly, human, natural love. I don't know about you. Uh, my mama wasn't perfect. Amen. But I always knew this that she loved me. Amen. And to say that I wasn't perfect would be a vast understatement of the case. Yeah. Every time I go, start looking through old pictures, I invariably find one or two that I say, oh my God. I wonder how embarrassed she was that day when her friends came over to the house and I was passed out with puke down the side of my shirt in the front room. Oops. But you know what? She loved me anyway. God's love loves you anyway, and He loves the people you hate anyway. Amen. Love reserved for those who deserve it is in no way different from an unbeliever. So the first measure I want to give you for your love walk this week is more a, a, a piece of homework. Think of somebody that you would, when you hear the word your enemies, pops immediately into your mind. And spend some time praying for them this week. Amen. If you want to get prayed for, just do me dirty. Amen. 
Amen. I hope none of you ever wait tables for me because I'll get terrible service. But if you want, if you want a good tip from me, give me bad service and treat me with contempt. Because in order to get my heart pure, I always double the tip for lousy service. It enables me to leave with a clean heart. Just telling you. As soon as I read this passage, that's what I started doing. I made it my... So, love is a commandment in the New Testament. Not, not in, in point of fact, it's the commandment for the New Covenant. Uh, what do you mean? Do you mean all the other commandments don't count? Well, not exactly, but the love commandment encompasses everything else. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. That tells us that as we look at the commandments under the Old Covenant, that gives us a picture of what God means when He says, love. Love doesn't steal stuff from folks. Love doesn't envy folks' stuff. Come on. Love doesn't mess around with a neighbor's wife. That's a very loose Oklahoma paraphrase. Of, of, but it's in there. In the, he put it in the top ten, man. <laughs> yes, he did. Love obviously doesn't murder. Love doesn't cuss. Not a single amen. Did you hear that? We're dead <laughs> silent in here, didn't we? Under the old covenant, let's look in John 13, just that, so in case you don't know where that is. <laughs> I was thinking about that yesterday, and I thought, I, the only time I can remember, now one time I remember my mama being up on the, on the step stool trying to clean the dust off of the, the ceiling fan in the dining, I call it a dining room, it was like a wide spot in the living room. The... Uh, our, our, the home I grew up in was two bedrooms, one bath, about 950 square feet. So, so every room was sort of intimate. But, the, but she, she, put a, she had a ceiling fan put in the dining, over the dining table, I guess would be a more accurate description. And uh, she was up there trying to clean that thing. Something happened, she dropped the thing she was using. And the, I, the term she used, and this was the first time I could ever remember hearing, even close, was, oh, hell's bells. But the only time I ever heard just outright cuss was when I told her I was going to Bible school. <laughs> she let me have it with both barrels, man. Okay for me to lay in the chair in the living room with puke on my shirt, but, but uh, go be a preacher? Oh, blankety-blank that. And she's a Christian? Anyway. It was not her finest moment. John 13, you there yet? Jesus said a new commandment, verse 34, I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. He gave us a new commandment. Why? Because under the new covenant, we were going to become new creatures. We have a new high priest, a new covenant, and a new covenant. And under that covenant. Now, he said he wanted us to love one another. The old covenant admonition was love your what? neighbor as yourself. Why? Because under the old covenant, that was the best they could attain to. I'll shoot at trying to treat you as well as I treat me. Probably won't get there, but I'll try. Under the new covenant, he said, I have now given you an example of of what real love looks like. I'm not going to treat you the way I treat myself. I'm going to treat you better than that. I'm going to treat you with the love of God that preemptively and sacrificially gave Himself for me even when I was cursing Him. He said, I want you to, do, in this particular case, He had just washed the disciples' feet on the night before His crucifixion. He saw fit to get down on his hands and knees and wash the feet of his disciples. And the thing that always moves me is Judas was still there. 
knowing exactly what he was about to do, Jesus washed his feet. He said, I want you to love one another like that. Amen. And he made it a commandment, not a suggestion. So your scorecard this week reads this way. When was the last time you did something for someone with expecting nothing in return? Because if you expect something in return, that's a business transaction. Come on. It's a commandment that can only be fulfilled. Because all of us, as soon as I said that about Judas, I saw some of the faces going. Because you, immediately you knew who I was talking about. Whatever your Judas' name happens to be. Come on, I got several. Amen. So what are you saying? I'm saying that this is a commandment from God that you absolutely cannot keep. In your own human strength, your own ability, it is not in you to do it. But what is in you to do it is the Holy Spirit of God. But you have to have the help of God to love people who despise you. It just ain't normal. But we're not called to be normal. We're not mere men and women. Galatians chapter 5. Let's look over there. He never commanded us to try harder to love each other. Why? Because you can't. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. He said, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Can I get an amen? amen? So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Neither are you free to carry out your bad intentions, I'm happy to report. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. What are you saying? It is this commandment of love and the impartation and empowerment of the Spirit that frees us from the Old Testament law. We're not keeping a set of rules anymore. We're being somebody. That's why all people come to me and say, is it okay for us, is it a sin to do this? For you, probably. Why? Because you wouldn't be asking me if you weren't convicted about it. You'd just be doing it. Come on. That's how I size it up for me. If I have to ask myself, I wonder if this would be a sin, just take that off the table. Obviously it is. The spirit on the inside of me has already told me and I'm trying to get somebody to override it for me. Trying to get permission from somebody when the Holy Ghost already said, "Uh uh-uh. Amen. Jumping down to verse 22, y'all are familiar with this passage, I'm sure. Galatians 5.22 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Everybody say self-control. Against such there is no law. Sometimes we leave that one out. The fruit of the Spirit. What does that mean, the fruit of the Spirit? Now, I, I, I'm not going to get into the, to, the, to the weeds here too much, but when I was first in Bible school, I was in so many situations around other Bible school students who are the most boring people in the world <laughs> arguing about whether or not this was the fruit of the reborn human spirit or the fruit of the Holy Spirit in us. I mean, I'm talking about all night at Denny's drinking coffee <laughs> and keeping the commandment of love toward each other by arguing. <laughs> and so my answer to them always once I finally received revelation is, is it the reborn human spirit or is it the Holy Spirit my answer is yes 
Take your pick. But the work of the Holy Spirit in and through your reborn human spirit does what? Produces, brings the fruit of love in your life. Everything that's not love, joy, peace, long-suffering, etc. came from someplace else than the Spirit. Yes. What is fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. What does that mean? Fruit. I'm going to use the term fruit. The outcome, yeah, it's what it causes. What it causes. When I go to visit guys in jail and they, you know, they rob somebody or something, they aren't complaining about being in jail. Is it fruit? <laughs> you sow it, it comes up. Amen. The same thing's true of the human spirit. Whatever's sowed in your heart, it comes up. He goes on to say that in the next chapter, actually. But uh, your scorecard for this week is to just rate yourself from 1 to 10. 10 being really good on each of the eight aspects of love given here. Did you know that, that when he says love, joy, peace, long-suffering, uh, several modern translations translate it this way. They put a, a colon after love and say that the next eight things are just aspects of love. It's not love and joy. Joy is part of love. It's not love and peace. Peace is part of love. It's not uh, love and self-control. Self-control is loving. Amen. There's a wonderful parallel with 1 Corinthians 13 that we could actually get down into, but we won't. But my point is this, that take those last eight things. Don't just take love. We're going to break it down to better metrics. Break it down to the eight parts of love that he lists here and just give yourself a rating on 1 to 10 how well you're doing by Wednesday. Amen. If 56 is the lowest C... then how are you doing? That's 70% of 80, by the way. The, uh, <laughs> amen. Now, that, it'll help us to go on to 1 Thessalonians 3, so let's do that. Because you need to understand, if love is like fruit, what does that mean? How many of you got fruit trees in your yard? Anybody? Anybody got a fruit tree in your yard? Oh, yeah. uh, let me ask you this. Uh, how does that work exactly? Do you go out there and put, like pull a lever and, and, and it spits out fruit? You water it, you kind of wait, and then, and then the, I know every year I get oranges from Henry. I walk outside, there's a sack on the hood of my car, and I think, yeah, Henry's been here. <laughs> Got me some oranges. But it only happens certain times of the year. I'd really like to have some July oranges sometimes. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> but it, when they first come out on the tree, uh, you take them off and, and try to chew them. They're hard to chew, man. Yeah, like the grapefruits. I get, I get grapefruits over here. So, <laughs> Being a pastor is a wonderful thing. People bring you stuff. Now, since I've been in Arizona, it's been a little spare. When we were in New York, I got blackberries every year, blueberries every year, and a quarter of a beef. Some of y'all need to raise me a cow. <laughs> or a hog. It was one, one year a hog, one year, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm, I, I'm not particular. I just, it just bothered me at all. Oh, well, got deer meat was a given. Brown trout and venison was just part of the culture. But it didn't cost them anything. Even got bear meat one year. But, the, but, but here in Tucson, it's pretty much grapefruits and oranges. Yeah. And I like grapefruits and oranges, so that's great. But the point is this. When they first come out on the tree, they're just little bitty, hard, green, ugly, you know, not much good for anything other than maybe using in your slingshot. Amen. But what happens to them? You water them, you nurture them, and they grow. Yeah, fruit grows. There's your word for the day. Let's say it with me. Fruit grows. Love is fruit. Therefore, love grows. Thank you. 1 Thessalonians 3. Verse 12 and 13 says, And may the Lord make your love for one another and for all people grow and overflow just as our love for you overflows. May He as a result make your heart strong, blameless, and holy as you stand before God our Father when our Lord Jesus comes again with all His holy people. Amen. What's He saying? He's saying if you'll allow God to grow the love in your life, then when Jesus returns, you will be confident to stand before Him. If you're living in love, then you will not have any reason to quail when the trumpet blows. 
Amen. He didn't say keep the law. He said let love grow. Amen. So love grows. So wherever you are on that, that scale I gave you just a minute ago, don't despair. Water. Fertilize. <laughs> grow the love of God in your heart. Amen. Our capacity for the God kind of love increases as we grow up. The two words he uses in the uh, King James there is to increase and abound. Let your love increase and abound. Uh, he uses two different Greek words that both basically mean the same thing. Let it get bigger and then let it get bigger. We want it to overflow and then we want it to overflow, overflow. Amen. He's talking here about the vast expanse of the possibilities of God loving through us. I think it's fascinating he didn't say, I want you all to start loving each other better or being more loving. He said, I pray that your love will grow. Amen. In the context here, he's actually talking about what will happen as he comes to visit them. He said, I want to come see you face to face so that I can perfect that which is lacking in your faith. He's saying, I'm going to come, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to minister to you, and it is going to allow you to have growing love for one another. Love grows through the ministry of the Word of God under the anointing of the Spirit of God through the gifts that God sent before you. Amen. This week's scorecard. When you read the Word or listen to teaching, what is the subject you most often listen to? And here's the thing that convicted me when I, I won't say I thought of it, I was sitting there minding my own business getting ready to encourage you to do something. And then uh, just had this thought. What do you spend your, all of your time studying and praying about? Is it your health and your wealth and your family? You ain't got over into love yet. That's our scorecard. How much of your devotional life is just for you? Amen. Now to 1 John chapter 4. Which is the key, I believe, for us allowing the love of God to work in our lives. Selfishness, self-centeredness is the root of all the opposite of love, isn't it? When it's all about me, it's definitely not about you. But in this passage in 1 John chapter 4, he gives us a couple of real clues to how that works for us or how we can allow ourselves to grow in the love of God. Verse 7 of 1 John 4. He said, Beloved, Talking to Christians, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone, everybody say everyone, who loves is born of God and knows God. Everybody, everybody who loves with this kind of love is number one, born of God, and number two, knows God. Amen? Hang on to that for just a minute. Because in the next verse, he says, He who does not love does not know God. For God is love. Notice what he just said. He said, those that love, everybody in the whole world that loves is born of God, number one. Number two, knows God. But those that don't love, don't know God. He didn't say they're not born of God. He's not really questioning your salvation here. He's questioning your intimate relationship with the God who is love. Dear friends, our devotional life, the interaction we have with God is about us knowing God. Not being born of God, not getting our needs met, but us improving our intimacy with our God. It's getting to know Him. Getting to know you. Getting to know more about you. 
Come on. You got that? Then verse 9. He said, In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation, that's a fancy word for sacrifice, for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. Amen. Three big things in that passage. Love is of God. He's the source and the only source. You can't just try harder to love people. You've got to know God more intimately to love people because it's Him that's loving through you. You have not the capacity in yourself. You can't do it by effort. And you can be born of God, but not know Him intimately and therefore find it impossible to love. And Jesus Christ in His sacrifice for us is the singular example in the history of the human race of the kind of preemptive sacrificial love of God. What does preemptive mean? He loved us first. He loved us first. Romans 5 eight says, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to straighten up. Because we tried to straighten up and we weren't having all that much luck. He died for us while we were yet cursing Him. That's preemptive love. God loves first. A friend of mine used to say, forgiveness means forgive. It means I give first. (laughs) Amen. The kind of love that he's talking about, the example we have, the place where we find it, is in that sacrifice and nowhere else. The scorecard in that aspect is what practice enhances your intimacy with the Lord? What do you do that increases your personal intimacy with the Lord. And then secondly, when was the last time you did that? Now down to verse 16 in 1 John 4. He said, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as He is, so are we in this world. Remember we saw in 1 Thessalonians 3. We have confidence when the Lord returns because we're growing in love. Here, John says basically the same thing. We'll be really happy when the Lord comes back because we've been abiding in love. Verse 17. Love has been perfected among us. Verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Notice this. We have known and believed the love that God has for us. The first step, most of us, if we've we've been born again, if we know Christ, if we've even been in church as little kids, we know that God so... Two two words and, and you know the verse. God so... Love the world, absolutely. John 3.16, it used to be at the end zone at every football game. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We, we know that. Why? So we intellectually understand God loved the world and He did it by giving us His Son. Amen. That's our doctrinal statement. But He says here, uh, we have known and believed the love that God has for us. I would say it this way, known and believe the love that God has for me. He said, God loves the world. Yeah, but did He love Virgil? Because I've been knowing Virgil all my life. And he's not that great a prize, I can tell you that. 
The only question I have about God is his taste in people. The first step in this process is know the love of God and believe the love that he has for you. Your love is maturity. He said perfected in love, but that's our word for, for maturity. We are made mature in love. Amen. We are made mature in love when we understand and believe the love that God has for us, and therefore we have no concern about the day of judgment. People talk about judgment day. It does not bother me. I am good to go. Amen. If you can't say that today, then it would be a good day to check up. Amen. Anyone who is tormented with fear, especially fear of judgment, fear of standing in the presence of the Lord, is not mature in love. For the next 24 hours, here's your assignment. Make a note every time you find yourself feeling afraid. If you believe the love that God has for you, what are you worried about? The thing that makes us confident, because sometimes people read this, that I won't have any fear if I will learn to love everybody right. There's no fear in love. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about there's no, once you understand the love God has for you, you don't have to be afraid anymore. He's talking about having a revelation of the love that God has for you and believing that revelation. If God loves, you know what? He loves me even when I don't know the formula. He, he loves me even when I know the formula and didn't do it. And I believe that's what Wilma was talking about just a little earlier. That uh, We hear these things about healing. We hear these things about provision. We hear these things about blessing on our family. And, and we understand that that's the will of God for them. But we know us. And, you know, I, I've screwed this up. I, I have a flash for you. Everybody can say that. All have sinned and fall way short of the glory of God. He said it kind in Romans when he just said fall short. I mean, to be perfectly accurate, he, he would have to say like light years short. Amen. We're all in that same boat. He said, I will be fearless when I know and believe the love that God has for me. What's that mean? That means He is going to take care of me no matter what. Amen. God's love is always preemptive. He loved us first. We love Him not because that we are so brilliant and so spiritually uh, superior to other people. We love Him purely and only because of the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ that we did not deserve, but He did it anyway. The key to fulfilling the commandment of love is believing the proclamation of love. Love is expressed, defined, and made plain in the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look for love anywhere else, even in your mama, even from your children. I get so pained when girls tell me I want to have a baby so they can love me. Oh my God. Please, have your tubes tied. I don't mean to be facetious, but goodness gracious. I mean, at least do something until you grow up enough to realize how stupid that sentence was. Amen. If you're looking for real love any place else but in the death and the burial for you of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you're looking at a lie. You're looking at some kind of human substitute for the kind of love that Jesus commanded to us. The better we know Him, the more like Him we become. John said, and we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. On that day when we see Him as He is, we will be finally transformed into the perfect image of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're on the way here. 
But on that day, we'll see him clearly. And we're growing more like him every day. So the question then is not, are you willing to try to love people more? The question is, are you willing to let God love through you with no restrictions, and no reservations? That may mean you don't like. I can almost guarantee that. It may mean being kind to people who are not kind to you. It may mean touching people who you want to wash your hands even before you get in the room with them. Jesus saw the leper. And the leper said, if you want to, you can make me whole. And Jesus reached out and touched him and said, I want to. Come on. Amen. I put it in your notes just for your edification. From 2 Peter chapter 1. Fabulous passage. Talking to Christians. If you've got your notes with you, you can look at it and we can read it together. Beginning in verse 5. 2 Peter chapter 1, the fifth verse. We're reading from the New Living Translation. You got it? Let's do it. In view of all this, Make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence and moral excellence with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with patient endurance and patient endurance with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you will be in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You want to be productive and useful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? Then let your love grow exceedingly. Amen. Let's stand up. We all still love me? It's a commandment, you know. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Praise your name. Bless you, Jesus, Lord. Praise your name. Worship you, Jesus. Worship you, Jesus. Worship you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Worship you, Lord. Magnify you. Heads bowed for just a moment. If you came today and you've never made that first step of committing your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you believe that God uh, sent Him to the cross for your sin. You believe that He was buried. You believe that God raised him from the dead. Then maybe it's time, if you believe all that, to live your life like you believe it. That begins by saying, yes, Jesus Christ is my Lord. If you've never taken that step, I want to give you that opportunity right quick. Come on. If that's you, you need to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life. Let's raise your hand. Where, where are you standing right now? Let me see it. Lift it so I can see it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless you, Jesus. Amen. Still with your heads bowed for a moment. If you're here today and, and your relationship with your mom or you're a mom and your relationship with your kids is fouled up, then uh, I'm not going to ask you to come up, but I am going to ask you, just wave at me that's you. Amen. I, I just want to make a prayer for those folks. Can we do that right now? That's kind of a big deal. And on this Mother's Day, we thank you, Father God, for you said in your word that you were the God of reconciliation. That God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And that you that's the ministry of reconciliation. This day, Father God, I pray for mamas and kids 
children who have strange relationships, that this would be the year of reconciliation for these relationships. I thank you, Father, for giving these precious ones that lifted their hand today, Father. The grace and the growth and the love of God that will enable them to love in that situation preemptively and without expectation of return. Believing, Father God, that relationships with people are restored the same way our relationship with you was restored. That somebody laid down their life for us before we had anything to offer in return. So Father, I thank You that these this day are given grace to love preemptively, to love sacrificially. I thank You for it in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Father, I thank You for these folks that came on a, a beautiful Sunday when they could have stayed home and, and gone to the Mother's Day buffet. And I thank You that you, you saved them a little food at the Mother's Day buffet. That they'll be blessed in it. I call them blessed. I call them healthy. I call them whole. In Jesus' name, everybody said, there are some special...